It is live stream. Don't worry, Ganesh. So we will be starting in this. Yep. So. Hello everyone, welcome to today's talk in the year-long series of seminars at Bhaskara Charipatishthan Pune. Today our speaker is Anvesh Sre, who is a postdoctoral fellow at University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Before moving to British Columbia, Anvesh did his PhD at Cornell with Professor Ravi Ramakrishna. And he will be joining CRM Montreal as a postdoc in September 2022 and as a tenure track faculty at Chennai Mathematical Institute in August 2023. Today he is about to speak on the modularity of the rigid Galois representations. And without taking much time, I would like to hand over this stage to Anvesh. Over to you, Anvesh. Thanks. Thank you so much, Devendra, for this introduction and the invitation. So um, today I'll be talking about modularity of rigid Galois representations. So essentially, um, I will be explaining some results due to Darmon. Um, so let's start with some notation. So um, K is going to be a number field. GK is going to be the absolute Galois group of K. So it's the Galois group of the algebra closure over K. And then um, K of T is going to be the function field of P1 over K. And its absolute Galois group is going to be denoted by G of KT. So now we can identify the Galois group of KT bar over K bar T with GK. And then we get this uh, exact sequence of Galois groups. And uh, given a, so P is going to be an odd prime number throughout and by F field denote a finite field of characteristic P. So given a point in P1 of K, we have an associate decomposition group. So this de decomposition group is sort of defined after we choose a prime, um, which lies above X inside this, inside the, uh, fun, the algebra closure of the function field. And we have the associate inertia group. So by design, there's a natural isomorphism of GX mod IX with the absolute Galois group. And now if you're given a continuous Galois representation defined on G of KT, we say that's unramified if um, uh, it, it kills the inertia group. So if, if the inertia group at X, is inside the kernel of this representation, we see that's an unmodified in X. So suppose X is the point at which this GABA representation, this rigid GABA representation is unramified, then we can basically restrict the GABA representation to the decomposition group G sub X, and then it's going to factor through the quotient G sub X mod I sub X. And so it's going to give us a GABA representation rho sub X at the point X. So for every point at which rho is unratified, we get a specialization, rho sub x, um, in this way. Just a little bit more notation here. So zeta n is going to be a primitive nth root of unity, and k sub n is going to be the real subfield of q zeta n. OK, so um, we come to notion of Fry representation. So um, these, these Galois representations are constructed using the rigidity method. And um, the construction, there's a purely um, Galba theoretic construction that I want to talk about. Um, so here, here's a notation. So PQ and R are three prime numbers, and they're not necessarily distinct. And we have the Diophantine equation x bar p plus by bar q equals e to the r. So associated to this Diophantine equation, we, get, we have a family of Galba conditions. So rho is a family. So in other words, it's basically a, a representation from G sub KT to GL2 of F. And it has to satisfy the following conditions. So number one, when we restrict rho to G of K bar T, it is irreducible and has trivial determinant. And so when we, so we get a representation to um, SL2 of F and then the geometric representation, which we denote by rho geom, uh, 
is going to simply be the projectivization of this representation. So we get a, a representation to SL2 of F and we just take the projectivization of this representation. Um, the second condition is that when we look at this representation, it's unramified away from zero, one, and infinity. And finally, um, if you look at the inertia groups at zero, one, infinity, um, this representation actually maps um, these inertia groups at zero, one, infinity to subgroups of PSL2 of F of order P, Q, and R respectively. So that is a dependence on these indices P, Q, and R. So P, Q, and R primes and the inertia groups at zero, one, infinity map to um, groups of order P, Q, and R. So ramification at those points is especially P, Q, R, right? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. So that's the dependence on P, Q, and R in this, uh, in this setup. Okay, so uh, just, um, just a few more remarks here. So suppose you're given a point inside P1 of K and um, uh, let's say it's a uh, point away from zero one infinity. You're gonna obtain a GABA representation uh, obtained by specializing at X, just as before. And um, if you're given a non-trivial solution to this equation, then what we do is we associate, we sort of specialize this non-trivial solution to um, setting x to be equal to eighth part p over CDR. And then this is this is what we call this is the uh, Fry representation, or right, this is this is the Gabriel representation we really care about because um, it has shown that uh, there's a quadratic twist of this representation which has very little ramification. Um, so that is the unique property that this specialization has. So for example, if you have the usual Fermat equation, x plus p plus y plus p equals e to the p, when you know all the primes are equal to p, then what we do here, uh, what we get here is we recover the gap application associated to the you know, Fry elliptic curve up to a quadratic twist. Okay, so um, we're gonna see that two Fry representations where one rotor equivalent if they're conjugate um, over over the algebra closure of F. Um, so if they're conjugate up to a central twist, then we say that, that they're equivalent. So in other words, if the projected rep representations are, con are conjugate, then we see that they're equivalent. So we have this equivalence relation, and the idea is that we can actually classify five representations up to equivalence. So just a few more definitions here. So um, suppose we take a point uh, in P1 and that the inertia group Bix this inertia group is actually isomorphic to Z hat. And what we do is we choose a topological generator of the inertia group at these, um, at the point zero, one infinity. So gamma J is a topological generator. So we have gamma naught, gamma one, gamma infinity. Um, and that sigma J just be the image of gamma J under the geometric representation. So we have three matrices. And uh, the point here is that the decomposition groups and the generators gamma j can be chosen such that this relationship is satisfied. So sigma naught, sigma one, sigma infinity is equal to one inside PSL to F. So this, this relation is satisfied. And um, so what we do here is we choose, we choose lifts sigma j tilde of sigma j from the projective. So these, these matrices sigma j are inside PSL two of F we can choose lifts to SL2 of F. So sigma J tilde is the lift of sigma G to SL2 of F. And so we are gonna say that the representation is even if the product um, of these lifts is equal to one, and it's odd if the product of these lifts is equal to minus one. So these are the two types of representations we have. And so how do we construct and classify these representations using uh, the rigidity method. So I'm just gonna you know, give a brief outline of this. So we use some results of, um, of Bandy, Fried, uh, Fried, Thompson, and Matza. And um, there's another method which involves uh, considering gap representations associated to certain hypergeometric abelian varieties. We'll talk about that later. So, um, um, so the strategy is as follows. So first we construct, uh, first the idea to, the first step is to construct the geometric gap representation, which is on the right away from zero one and two. 
and try and extend it to a rigid GABA application. So the idea here is that the GABA group of KBAR T has a very nice structure. So if you look at the maximum quotient of this GABA group, which is unramified away from zero one infinity, we get the profile completion of the fundamental group of P1 minus three points. And the fundamental group of P1 minus three points is generated by you know, three loops. So we have loops around zero one infinity. So we have alpha not alpha one and alpha infinity. These are three loops around zero one infinity. And they're subject to this relation alpha not alpha one alpha infinity equals one. So therefore, this quotient is topologically gen generated by these, uh, these elements subject to this condition. Um, and then in order to sort of uh, specify this geometric representation, so this geometric representation over here, if you want to construct such a representation, you need to know where you know, the generator alpha j goes to. So we're going to pick three matrices. Um, so sigma j is a matrix in PSL2 of f, such that alpha j maps to sigma j. And um, basically, they have to satisfy the relationship that sigma naught, sigma one, and sigma infinity, that product is equal to one. So then the point is that we have, so by this method, we actually construct representation defined on GK of RT. And then in order to extend it to representation of GKT, we use what I called um, rigidity theorems. So it allows us to extend a GAL representation defined on GK bar of T to a representation on GKT. And we also use uh, certain uh, cosmological inputs as well. And um, as a result, we can actually, uh, like one can actually classify uh, FRI representations associated to these, uh, these, um, uh, these equations. Okay, so let us now, um, I'm not gonna say any more about this construction. So let us now um, just briefly uh, summarize the results which are proven uh, using this method. So first we start with the um, classical Fry representation associated to x plus p plus y plus p equals e plus p. So this is the classical Fermat equation. So in this situation, um, the result actually goes all the way back to Hecker. Um, so in this situation, the, um, the field can be taken to be equal to q and the the, re the field um, the field F, so the field of characteristic P can be taken to be equal to FP. So here FP is at mod PZ. And so there's actually a unique fire representation of two improvements associated to this equation over here. And furthermore, this representation is odd in the sense that, you know, um, the product of the lifts, sigma naught tilde, sigma one tilde, sigma infinity tilde. So let's just go back to the definition over here. Um, so it's odd in the sense that, sorry, uh, I just sort of missed it. So um, I'm just, yeah, so it's odd in the sense that basically when we take lifts, um, sigma naught tilde, sigma one tilde, sigma infinity tilde of sigma g to SL2 of f, the product is actually equal to minus one. Um, okay, so that, that's, it. that's a unique fire representation associated to, um, to this equation. The classical from my equation. And then let's look at the next, um, next, next case, basically when we have x bar p plus y bar p equals e to the r. So the significance of this is that, so p is always going to be the characteristic of the fire representation. So the characteristic of the field f, um, which is, you know, the target field is going to be p, right? So um, in this situation, p and r are going to be distinct terms. We're going to assume that p is r. And um, K is going to be the totally real subfield of Q zeta R. And F is going to be the residue field of K at a prime of P. So then in this situation, with this choice of K and this choice of F, there are exactly R minus one prime representations um, of two equivalents for us. So, for instance, so when R is an odd prime, then exactly half of them, R minus one over two are even, and the other half are odd. Um, so this is the classification one gets um, when, when you know, R is allowed to be some prime, which is not equal to And we'll sort of, we'll sort of um, give uh, uh, a construction using hypergeometric varieties later. Okay, so then let's look at the next case uh, considered by Darmon. So x bar r plus y to bar r equals e to bar p. 
So, I mean, what is the difference between this equation and the previous one, right? So, I mean, the two equations are the same, but the point is that, you know, the role, so P is the characteristic of this field F. So now what we're doing is we're looking at x to the power r plus by the power equals um, equals e to the power p. Okay, so um, in this situation, um, it's a little bit similar. So k is going to be the same field, the totally real self field of q zeta r, and f is the same field, which is the residue field of k at the prime, at a prime above p. So in this situation, there, there are r minus one into r minus two over two for our representations and uh, up to equivalence, and then r minus one square over four of these representations are odd, and r minus one into r minus three over four representations are even. Okay, so, um, and finally, we have representations, uh, five representations when p, q, and r are actually distinct primes, and we're gonna assume here that p is odd, and so now k is going to be the totally real self field of q zeta r zeta q, and F is going to be the residue field of Q at a prime above P. So again, in this situation, there are R minus one into Q minus one over two Fry representations up to equivalence, and then uh, R minus one into Q minus, so half of them are actually going to be R and half of them are going to be E. Okay, so this is the classification that one has. So um, this might sound, that might seem very confusing at first and a lot of information to, uh, to deal with, but now um, that's sort of, see how to get these representations, at least most of them, uh, from hypergeometric abelian varieties. Okay, so let's start with the, the classical Fermat equation. So what we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna define some explicit equations to sort of, um, to realize these representations. So for this, for this classical uh, Fermat equation, one considers the Legendre family. So um, here T is a varying parameter, uh, parameter. And we have J, which is basically given by Y squared equals X minus one into X minus two. So now the point is that when T is not equal to zero, one infinity, we get, we get an elliptic curve. So we look at the P torsion of J. This is uh, two copies of FP, two copies of Z mod PZ. And this is actually a module of the GABA group of QT. Um, so then the associate representation that we get um, so from G of QT to GL2 of FP is a fire representation associated to X bar P plus Y bar P equals to bar P. So one, in order to prove this, one has to show that the representation is unramified away from zero, one infinity. And then one has to show that um, the, um, the inertia groups at zero, one infinity, uh, their, their orders are uh, mapped to um, unipotent elements inside uh, SL2 of FP of order Okay, so, um, so then we come to um, x bar p plus y bar p equals e to the r, and let's specialize to r equals two. So in this situation, we can write down a family of elliptic curves given by y squared equals x cubed plus two x squared plus tx. Once again, um, if t is not equal to zero, one or infinity, we get an actual elliptic curve. And then we take them uh, associated mod p representation, and this is the fire representation which can be constructed uh, explicitly in this, in this way. Okay, and then uh, what, what happens when R is odd? So in this situation, when R is odd, then we no longer have families of elliptic curves. We have families of a billion varieties of GL2 type. So now P and R are distinct R primes. And so now the construction is a little bit more involved. And the idea is to sort of, the abelian varieties that we have to construct, they need to have um, multiplication by, this totally real field K. So, so here's a little bit of notation. So remember that zeta R is the art in the root of unity. So omega J is zeta R to the J plus zeta R to the minus J. Omega J is contained in the totally real self field of Q zeta R. So we're gonna let omega be equal to omega one. So omega actually generates this field K, which is the totally real self field of Q zeta R. Then the degree of k over q is equal to r minus one over two. So, um, so this is the totally real self field or over which um, the GAB repetition is going to be defined. So, g of x is the characteristic polynomial of minus omega, and it's given by the product of x plus omega j, where j ranges uh, from one to r minus one over two. And we're gonna set f of x to be equal to x times g of x squared minus two. 
And we consider the following hyperliptic curves. So uh, CR minus is going to be defined by this equation, y squared equals f of x uh, plus 2 minus 4t. And CR plus is going to be defined by y squared equals x plus 2 and 2, the same, same polynomial. And then GR plus minus is the Jacobian of CR plus minus over Q. So now the property that this Jacobian has is that the endomorphism ring, so this should be K of T, the endomorphism ring over K of T is isomorphic to O's of K. So in other words, has real multiplication by K. And then once again, F is going to be the residue field um, of K at a prime love P. We're going to choose a homomorphism from O of T to F, which is going to be called uh, phi. So the point is associated to this choice, um, so associated with choice of sign, plus or minus, and, and associated with choice of phi, you know, we can define this, um, the, we look at the P torsion in GR plus minus of P, and then we tensor it with F, and then we get a two-dimensional F vector space. So this is a module over the Galbra group of KT. And then we look at the associated two-dimensional Galbra representation. And we call these representations rho R plus minus. And um, we sort of suppress the dependence of this representation on phi in this integration. So in this way, we have actually constructed um, all the R minus, R minus one um, characteristic P phi representations. Associate to x part of p plus y part of p equals e to the r. Um, so basically, there are r minus one over two choices of maps from O to k to f. And of course, there are for every one of these maps, there are two choices of sign. And so in total, we have r minus one um, representations. So the representations rho r plus are even in the representations rho r minus r. So this is um, an explicit construction of the representations. Um, that were arising from the rigidity method. So then look at this. So I just want to go over one more construction here. This is, um, and then we'll sort of talk about modularity theorems. Um, so then let's look at x bar r plus y bar r equals z to bar p. So, the, so again, p is the residue characteristic. So p and r are now going to be distinct odd primes. Here the construction is a little bit more involved. Um, but it's, it's not too difficult to write down existing equations. So U is going to be T over T minus one. And then we define these two um, families of curves defined over QT as follows. So XRR minus is going to be Y to the power two R equals um, this equation over here, this expression. And then XRR plus is going to be Y to the power R equals this expression. So, okay, so it's it's the same the same expression on the right hand side. Um, so for every value of t, um, we get a value of u, and then we get a curve for every value of t. So and then we have another family of elliptic curves, and so now on the left hand side we have y square equals the same expression as above, and so we we consider these three families of curves. So x r r minus x r r plus and and g. And we have an evolution of XRR plus minus, uh, which basically takes XY to U over X, one over Y. Um, and it's also an evolution of J. And then we also have maps relating these curves. So um, XRR minus maps to J under this map pi, which takes XY to XY to R. And then XRR minus maps to XRR plus um, by the map PXY to XY squared. And um, so then the point is that the involution tau acts on XR plus and XR minus and on G as well. So we can do modulo tau to obtain the curves CRR plus minus and J prime is going to be just J mod tau. And then these maps pi and pi R actually descend to maps defined on these quotients by tau. So we have a map pi from CRR minus to J prime and a map pi r from CRR minus to CRR plus. So GRR plus is just gonna be the Jacobian of CRR plus. And the, the other Jacobian that we wanna consider here as follows. So the maps pi and pi r def define maps on Jacobian. So pi star is a map from G prime 
to um, the Jacobian of CRR minus, and then pi r up a star is a map from JRR plus, which is the Jacobian of CRR plus to Jacobian of CRR minus. So we have these two maps. Um, so we have these two maps uh, at the level of Jacobians, and then JRR minus is basically defined to be the Jacobian of CRR minus modulo the images of these two Jacobians. Um, Okay, so therefore we've defined two Jacobians, JRR plus and JRR minus, and both of them have a uh, real multiplication by K. And then these are going to give rise to, uh, these are once again going to give rise to the phi replication. So the Jacobians JRR plus and minus are the ones uh, that give rise to these phi replications. Once again, we have to fix a map from O sub K to F and um, for every such choice of map, we have two Jacobians. And in total, we have R minus one over two maps. Um, uh, and we actually will obtain all the five representations in this way. Um, yeah, so everything actually also depended on a choice of parameter J. So everything depended on choice of parameter J. Um, so the number of choices, uh, the number of odd integers from one to r minus two. So I've sort of suppressed that in this notation, but the point is with all these choices of j and the sine and phi, we actually will obtain all the fire representations. Okay. And finally, there was the, the general case when p, q, and r actually distinct odd primes, um, sorry, distinct primes and p is odd. Um, and I'm not gonna give an explicit construction in that situation because that construction is a little bit too involved. Um, okay, so now let's talk about modularity of these representations in these families. So first we have a modularity lifting conjecture. So K is gonna to be a totally real field and P is gonna be an odd prime. And E is gonna be a fine extension of QP and the valuation ring, which is a DVR here is gonna be denoted by O sub E. And F is going to the residue field. So here uh, pi is a uh, uniformizer of, um, of O sub E. So suppose you have this continuous scalar representation, uh, bro, from G sub K to G del GL2 of E, um, and we're gonna say that it's modular if it arises from Hilbert modular form on GL2 of K. So, I mean, uh, I'm assuming that this notion has been discussed in a lot of detail in previous talks. Just gonna go ahead with, you know, um, I'm not gonna talk about this in too much detail here, but basically here we have to sort of choose a Hecke eigenplus form on GL2 of K and a prime, uh, frac P in the field of Fourier coefficients of F, such that the associated representation actually matches up with rho. And then we're gonna say that rho arises from F. Um, so here are some properties that modular GABA applications have to satisfy. Um, so suppose rho is modular, then it satisfies some additional properties. So the first property is that rho must be unramified away from a finite set of primes of K. So there are only finally many primes of ramification that rho could possibly have. And the other property is that basically rho has to satisfy some local conditions at the primes above P. So P is basically the residue characteristic of, uh, of O sub E. Um, so at the decomposition groups of the primes above P, um, rho must satisfy some extra hypotheses, which are defined using chaotic Hart's theory. Um, so this goes, you know, way back, but uh, rho has to be potentially semi-stable at these primes. Okay, so um, suppose we're given such a GABA representation, rho, we let V sub rho be the underlying vector space, which is two-dimensional E vector space, and we can always choose a stable um, O sub E lattice, L inside V sub E, which is stable under the action of G sub K, under rho. So let's call this lattice L. And the choice of L is not necessarily unique. Um, so suppose we choose such a, such a lattice, then we get a representation, an integral representation on this lattice, which will also, uh, by abusive notation, also denote by rho. And this is gonna be a representation, a continuous representation from G sub K to GL2 of O sub K. Because we, you know, we now have a lattice, we get matrices in GL2 of O sub E now. And then we can go modular the uniformizer to get the residue representation associated to the lattice. And we'll call this residue representation is what we call a row bar here. 
So now, um, of course, everything depended on a choice of lattice L. And the point is that the semi simplification of row bar is independent of the choice of this lattice. So for instance, if row bar is, row bar is irreducible, then, you know, then row bar is uniquely determined. And if row bar is reducible, then you know, um, it depends on the choice of lattice. So a different lattice could give another reducible representation. Um, but you know, row bar is well defined up to semi simplification. So in this situation, we're going to see that row bar is modular if it arises from a Hecke class, uh, eigenclass form G. So, um, so there, in other words, if there's a choice of lattice such that we actually get row bar up to semi simplification um, from some Hecke eigenclass form. So for instance, if row bar is irreducible, there is no ambiguity about the choice of lattice. But if row bar is reducible, then we actually just insist that we actually get row bar up to semi simplification and not on the nodes. Um, okay, so uh, here's the conjecture of Darmon. So um, suppose we have some gap replication. Let's just assume for the, for a moment it's an integral gap replication. Um, we're going to assume that it's unramified away from finitely many primes, and it satisfies this condition that it's potentially semi-stable at um, the primes above p. So then, if we assume that rho bar is modular, then uh, rho itself is modular. So this is the modularity lifting conjecture that uh, we will assume in order to establish, um, to sort of explain Darmon's theorem, which ex establishes uh, modularity in these uh, rigid gap repetitions. Um, any questions before we move on? Okay. So, um, okay, so now, so now we come to modularity of the rigid Galbraith representation. So I'm going to basically give, um, you know, the definition of a rigid Galbraith representation, which I have not done before. I've only given some examples. So uh, K is going to be a totally real field. P is an odd prime. So once again, O sub V is, you know, a DVR with residue characteristic P. And um, we're going to say that, so we have a representation rho. We're going to say that this is a rigid gap representation is unramified away from the points you're wanting to. So once again, at the points you're wanting infinity, let, uh, let gamma j be a generator of the inertia group, and let sigma j be the image of gamma j inside GLT of O sub So it can be shown in this situation that the semi simplification of um, sigma j is actually finite, and this order is what we call ng. So ng is the order of the semi-simplification of sigma j. Um, so n is going to be the LCM of n naught, n1, and n infinity. And it can be shown that if you have such a rigid gap representation, this rigid, so this field k, which is um, the field of definition, must necessarily contain the totally real subfield of QZ land, where N is the LCM of these, these values. So, and in general, if K strictly contains K sub N, then after a, quadra after a quadratic twist, one can, actually, um, one can actually assume that rho itself is defined on GK N of T. So um, for the purposes of uh, simplicity, if you're sort of trying to establish modularity, we can just simply assume that Rho itself is defined on Kn of T. Um, so here Kn is the totally real subfield of QZ and N. Okay, so here's the theorem of Dermon. It says that if Rho is a rigid gap representation, um, such that at least one of these matrices sigma j is unipotent. So we have three matrices, at least one of them is unipotent. In addition, if you assume that A does not divide N, which is the LCM of N not N1 and infinity, then, then basically, um, um, then the specializations away from zero, one infinity will actually all arise from Hilbert modular forms on GL2 of K. And this assumes the modularity lifting conjecture. So essentially what one can prove is that all the residual representations in family will actually be modular. Um, okay, so let's try and explain how, um, how this is proven. But first, we'll just um, talk about rigid gap representations a little bit more detail. 
Um, so an admissible triple is a triple of elements, sigma naught, sigma one, sigma infinity. These are three matrices which belong to SL2 old C and such that the following additional conditions are satisfied. So the semi-simplification of sigma j has to be finite of order nj. And then the group generated by these three elements has to be an uh, irreducible subgroup of SL2 of E. And finally, the product, uh, sigma naught, sigma one, sigma infinity has to be equal to one. So what is the point of this definition? The point here is that uh, one wants to sort of construct rigid GABA representations as before. The way to construct them was to first define them on the group GK bar of T, and then try and extend them to the group GKT. And then the maximal um, quotient of GK bar of T, which is unramified away from 0, 1, and infinity. Um, so as we remarked before, was the um, uh, prof uh, profinite completion of the fundamental group of P1 minus three points, which is topologically generated by three elements satisfying this, this relation. So in order to construct these Galbra conditions, um, defined on GK bar of T, we just need triples in S2 of, S2 of O sub V satisfying these conditions. And such a triple is basically called an admissible triple. So um, the theorem that is proven by rigidity is the following. So um, remember that N is the LCM of N naught, N1, and N infinity, which were the errors of the semi-simplifications of the matrices above. Um, so if you're given admissible triple, then we can actually construct a rigid Galbraith representation, such that basically the non-dreamy matrices are basically sigma naught, sigma one, sigma three, and zero one three. So in other words, the um, the generators for the inertia groups will map to Sigma naught, sigma one, sigma infinity. So, so we can construct these rigid GABA conditions in this space proceeded to um, admissible triples. So, what is the relationship between admissible triples, rigid GABA conditions, and hypergeometric abelian varieties, real multiplication? So, um, so we've seen a lot of hypergeometric abelian varieties in this talk, but the um, it's no surprise the definition is as follows. So hypergeometric abelian variety is an abelian variety. It's an abelian scheme, which is defined over Q, and it's an abelian scheme over P1 minus these points. And the dimension is Q over Q. And uh, in addition, we need, uh, so there needs to be a Galba equivalent isomorphism of the endomorphism group of A with S of K. And the associated data reputation um, has to be reducible. Okay, so we uh, said this is the definition of hypergeometric abelian variety. And the result that can be proven is that if we have a Richard Galbraith representation arising from an invisible triple, um, then, sorry, this is a typo, this should be O sub E. Um, Okay, so suppose we have Richard Galbraith representation arising from an invisible triple, then essentially it comes from. Um, a hypergeometric abelian variety. Um, so uh, you can actually associate hypergeometric abelian variety to a rigid gamma repetition. Um, just sort of explain this a little bit more detail. So suppose we have hypergeometric abelian variety with multiplication by k, right? And then what we can do is we can associate to this hypergeometric abelian variety uh, a triple value, sigma naught, sigma one, sigma infinity inside SL2 of O sub K. And here are basically sigma J is basically going to be the image of the generator of the inertia group um, at J to, uh, on acting on the Duram cohomology group. So this Duram cohomology group is a two-dimensional K vector space. We just look at the image of um, sigma J acting on this two-dimensional K vector space and we can actually get, we actually will get um, an element in SL2 of OK. Um, different up to conjugation, of course. Um, so we get these three matrices uh, in this following way. Um, and so this is, so we get an admissible triple in SL2 of O sub K. Um, so if, uh, conversely, if you, have, if you have an admissible triple in SL2 of O sub K, let's say sigma naught, sigma one, sigma infinity, then it also, then there's an, um, this hypergeometric abelian variety that actually will realize this admissible triple. So essentially coming back to the previous slide, so we have a rigid Galbraith representation which basically corresponds to the miscible triple. And basically um, 
you know, an admissible triple corresponds to hypergeometric abelian varieties. So we can sort of relate all of these uh, notions. So if you're given a rigid GABA condition, we can just, we, we automatically have an hypergeometric abelian variety realizing that rigid GABA condition. Okay. So now in order to establish modularity, we have to basically show that these hypergeometric abelian varieties um, are modular. Um, and of course, you have to assume this modularity of thin conjecture to establish this. So here's the inductive argument uh, that Darmon uses. So suppose we start off with a rigid lab representation. So remember that up to twist, we can assume that it's defined on Kn of T. Right? So Kn was the totally real subfield of QZN. Um, so here are sigma naught, sigma one, sigma infinity are the matrices, um, the monodromy matrices in SL2 of O sub E. And N is the LCM of the orders of the semi-simplifications of these matrices. So, um, so the point is that, so this representation arises from a hypergeometric abelian variety A with multiplication by Kn and we'll denote, so we'll set K to be equal to Kn, right? That was the content of the previous slides. And then uh, this triple basically was defined by the action of the uh, so the action on the Duran cohomology of this abelian variety. We can assume that this triple actually lies inside S L two of O of K, and then we view it as a triple in S L two of O of V by basically looking at the map from O of K to O of V. So K at, um, so E is a localization, sorry, a completion of K. So um, this is so we can actually sort of see, view the triple inside S L two of O of K. So the argument is by induction on n, right? So n is the LCM of n not n one n infinity, and um, so for instance, if n is equal to one, then uh, k k which is k n is equal to q itself, and in this situation, uh, the abelian variety the abelian variety has real multiplication by q, so um, it has to basically be a family that occurs defined over q. And the result of modularity directly follows from known results on modularity elliptic curves due to Wiles, Taylor Wiles, um, Roy Con Conrad, Diamond, Taylor. Um, so basically, the case when n equals one um, and the, the totally real field is Q itself is well known. Um, so then the idea is to try and reduce to the case when n equals one. So let's assume that n is greater than one and k is not equal to q. So for instance, if n is two or four, then once again, k is equal to q. So we can, and, and we've also assumed that a does not divide n. Um, so that was one of the hypotheses. So therefore we can assume that n has an odd prime divisor because we're assuming that k is not equal to q. So that l be an odd prime divisor of n and n prime is going to be n over L. And k prime is going to be k of n prime. So k of n prime is just the truly real subfield of q zeta n prime. So k prime is contained inside k. And here's the argument. So we choose a prime um, lambda of k, which lies above L. And then below lambda, there's a prime lambda prime of k prime. So let F be the residue field of K at lambda. And we can notice that lambda prime is totally ramified in K. So when we look at the extension from K prime to K, you know, lambda prime is totally ramified in that field. So basically the residue field at lambda prime is also equal to F. So the residue fields are both equal to F. And we choose compatible maps. Um, so we choose a map from O sub K to F. And we can compatibly also choose a map from O of K prime to F. So these maps are uh, called phi and phi prime respectively. So the argument is as follows. So we, um, so we have our initial triple, which is sigma naught, sigma one, sigma infinity. We reduce this to, so remember that this triple is basically, uh, so it consists of matrices in O of K. And then we basically reduce by this map phi. So we reduce to the residue field of K at lambda. So we have a triple phi of sigma naught, phi of sigma one, phi of sigma infinity. Okay, so this is a triple inside SL2 of F. 
And then by this map V prime, we lift this, this triple to a triple inside SL2 of OK prime. So the point is that we start off with triple in sigma naught. So we start off with the triple in SL2 of OK. And by this method, we basically, um, you know, obtain a triple in SL2 of OK prime, which is a smaller number ring. And so this triple that we obtain is what we call sigma naught prime, sigma one prime, sigma infinity prime. And then associated with this new triple, which is defined as uh, so this is in SL2 of OK prime, we have an abelian variety A prime with multiplication by K prime um, associated with this new triple. Okay, so the point is that the degree of K prime over Q is smaller than the degree of K over Q. Right, that's the induction, inductive hypothesis will come in. So n prime uh, is less than n. Remember that k prime was k of n prime. So by inductive hypothesis, a prime is modular in fibers. Okay, but now these two triples were constructed so that they were congruent modular p. And it follows from this that basically the residual representations associated to e and a prime um, actually isomorphic up to some justifications. Actually isomorphic as in this situation is GK prime T up to simplification, of course. Um, now, A prime is modular. So therefore this residue representation here is modular. And so therefore we obtain that the residue representation on A itself is modular. Um, and since we're assuming the modular uh, conjecture, if the residue representation on A is modular, then, then basically the lifting conjecture tells us that A itself is modular. Right, so this is the content of the modular Larry lifting conjecture. Let me just go back to the conjecture just to sort of refresh our memory. Um, yeah, so the conjecture was that if you have this representation rho, and if the residue representation is modular, then rho itself is modular. And of course, these two conditions are actually automatically satisfied in our given situation. Um, so since we're assuming this conjecture, uh, Darmon actually is able to prove that um, as a result of this, um, A itself is modular, right? And this actually is what will establishes the modularity um, modularity of A in fibers. So this, this uh, rigid gap representation associated to A is modular in fibers. So in other words, for every value of T away from zero by infinity, we have a modular than infinity. Okay, so that is that is all that I want to say for today. Um, so I hope this was helpful and uh, thank you for uh, for having me. Thanks, Anvis, for this wonderful talk. Anyone has any questions on this talk? It's very high power. Yeah, I, I mean, I was, I was asked to speak about modularity in these, uh, in this, uh, in family representations, but I realized that I need to give some motivation for, you know, the objects that are coming up. So I think I may have, you know, um, done some stuff that other people later would like to have introduced, but I needed that stuff in order to explain this result. So, um, but I mean, there's still a lot that needs to be explained. So I still haven't talked at all about, you know, the implications of these results or like the level lowering aspect. And I expect that people later, uh, so later on speakers will actually talk about those aspects um, in, in more detail. So I wanted to understand that uh, relationship with the topological fundamental yes, model, good. even minus three points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the admissible yeah. triples. Yes, yes, exactly. So that's a good that's a good point. Um, so I mean, how does one how does one explain this, right? So uh, maybe I'm, I should. This is be a good time for me to sort of share my tablet screen. Um, Okay, so um, do you think it's possible? Do you think it's possible for me to share my tablet screen? I just logged in via my tablet. Um, 
Um, Owen, are you there? Can you make him co-host on this iPad? Mm -hmm. Hello, Owen. Ah, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I just need to write down something in order to explain this because, you know, um, okay. so, so let's see. So, so the point here is that, so we have, yeah, so we have, um, we have some fields. So, so we have um, K, T bar, right? And so this is this is the algebra closure of T and T, and then we have K bar T, and then we have K T. And the point is that this this Galba group over here is isomorphic to G K. Okay. So now the point is that so 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 G K is obviously you know there's a lot, lot of uh, number theoretic. I mean, I mean, so this is like an arithmetic object, but this Galba group over here is called the, this is kind of like a geometric Galba group in the following sense. This is our GK bar T. So the result is as follows. So, um, so for every point, so let's say we take a point inside P1 of K bar. So associated to this point, we have, um, we will get uh, an ideal. So associate this part point with an ideal um, in k bar of t. Okay, so suppose we choose three points, zero, y, infinity, right? So then what we can do is we can look at the maximum tension um, of k bar of t, which is unramified away from these three points. So, so th this is a very large, so like, I mean, this is sort of like the construction that we sort of familiar in number uh, two, number three. So for instance, if you take a maximum extension, just unramified away from some prime numbers. So here we're taking maximum extension unramified away from these three, you know, ideals, right? So, um, so let's just call that bar T um, and let's just put a uh, superscript for these points. So S is gonna be the set of points, zero, one, infinity. And maybe I should call this K T bar. So what this means is we look at the maximum extension, which is unramified away from these three. So this is actually going to be a Galba extension. It's going to be contained inside the field K T bar. And then this Galba group over here is pretty well understood. So let's call this Galba group G uh, K bar T S. Right. So this Galba group over here is pretty well understood. So we look at P1, right, minus these three points. We take its fundamental group. So this fundamental group has a pretty nice structure. It's generated by three elements. Um, it's generated by elements, let's call them alpha naught, alpha one, alpha infinity, as a free group, so it's a non-boolean group. We're subject to the relation that alpha naught, alpha one, alpha infinity is equal to one. The reason for this is that if I choose a, choose a base point, then if I look at alpha naught, and then I look at um, alpha one, look at alpha infinity. So I, I, I go through these three loops, right? And maybe I've gotten the orientation wrong. So maybe this one should be pointing in this way. So I look at these three loops, I look at them one after the other. This is actually, so you can imagine everything sitting inside P1. So P1 basically is like a sphere. And if I look at these three loops, then basically these three loops is, are going to basically give me, um, the, it's, it's, it's actually going to be uh, homotopic to, um, it's going to be homotopic because, you know, you have three loops like this. And so we can sort of separate them out and eventually you get, you can imagine just sort of um, separating them out to actually get a loop 
that looks like this, which is not home topic. Um, so that for the product of these three to one, this is the only nation over here. And I guess what I was trying to say is that when you look at this free group and take its profile completion, so let's call this group G. So we take the profile completion of G. This is this is actually isomorphic to this this um, this GABA group G K bar of, G K bar of T um, unramified away from X. Right. So because of this. We can define GABA applications defined on GK bar of T. So um, once again, coming back to this diagram, so we have K bar of T, um, and then so I K bar of T over here, K bar of T S, and then we have K bar of T here, and then we have um, K of T over here. And so the point is that because we know what this this group is, we can define GABA completions defined on this group and extend them to GABA completions on GK bar of T. So we define GABA completions on this group um, using this description, right? So once we have a GABA completion here, so we have rho geom. Um, so this is defined from GK bar of T to uh, let's say, so we have geom to F, um, and so once we have such a representation, then we can try and extend it to a representation on G, G of KT. So we send it to a representation of, on G of, a, of G, on a, on G of KT. And to do this, we need to use the rigidity terms. But the point is that the reason why we can start off, we can first define representation of G of K bar T is because this extension is pretty well understood. And so basically this extension is topologically uh, generated by these three matrices subject to the relation. So therefore we need to basically just choose three matrices in GL2 of F satisfying that relation. And then we'll actually get a representation defined on GK bar of T. And then we use the rigidity terms to extend that to representations on GKT. Now, I mean, at the rigidity terms only allow you to extend the representations extend uh, projective representations. And then in order to extend a projective representation to a full representation, you need some additional um, H2 vanishing terms. Um, but I mean, those details you can actually look up in Darmon's paper. Which vanishing terms? Some, so so uh, the rigidity terms will actually, uh, will actually only sort of allow you to extend this representation to some projective representations. Um, and in order to extend the project representation all the way up to a L2 F representation, you need to um, you need some you know cohomology vanishing terms. Okay, okay. So, so the isomorphism of this profinite fundamental group and this Galba group. Yes. Mm -hmm. So a good reference for a good reference for this isomorphism, you can look at. Um, I mean, this is where I learned it from. Um, I think it's called inverse Galba theory or introduction to inverse Galba problems, yeah. So, I mean, this is a book where they talk about the rigidity method uh, in a lot of detail. And in, like right in the beginning, they talk about these types of isomorphisms. And um, so this is, this is like literally a book about the inverse Galba problem. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a good place to learn this, this um, result from. And of course, like, you know, there's also Sarah's book, which um, Darmon refers to in his papers. Yeah. Um, so that's also a nice book to look at. But I think this, so this book actually um, specifically goes into rigidity, like within the first one or two chapters. Um, yeah, okay, thanks, it was very helpful. Are there any more questions? If not, let us thank the speaker again for this very thank you. An important topic. Very advanced, in my opinion. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. So yeah, kind should... of relating this uh, triangle groups and fundamental group of the topology with the directly Galva group and its representation. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, anyways, we will be closing. So thanks for yeah. your second talk in this series. Uh, wow. how, long, how long have you been at uh, University of British Columbia? Oh, I've only been here since 2020, September. Yeah, and it is <laughs> like, I mean, because of COVID, I've, I've not really gotten to know many people over here. And it's like, you know, the department has just opened up and I'm leaving right now. So <laughs> I know a person in the Sanskrit department there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sate, Sate. Okay. Okay. Um, I will ask Sujata if he, if she knows if she knows um anyone there. So, um. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Amit. Send me the slide. Maybe these notes also that is scribbled. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Goodbye. Bye. Well, thanks again. For Have everything. a nice day. You too. So this is the last day of explaining the region I work. I didn't just talk particularly. This is based on the seven page paper of finals. Finals. Right on.